Renewable energy technologies have been emerging in the past few years, offering clean and sustainable energy as alternatives for conventional generation methods. Wind and solar farms have demonstrated their potential in many places around the globe. However, due to their intermittence and unpredictability, they cannot provide a continuous energy supply. As a solution, energy storage systems provide a way of storing renewable energy during periods of overgeneration and re-injecting it back into the grid during periods of undergeneration, ultimately decoupling the supply from the demand. A flow battery is an electrochemical device that delivers electrical energy resulted from a reduction and oxidation or redox reaction. Unlike a conventional battery where energy is typically stored within the electrodes, a redox battery stores the active solution in a separate reservoir which is then pumped over the battery's electrodes. The main advantage of this is that it enables the power through increasing the active electrode area and energy through increasing the volume of the electrolyte to be decoupled. Hence, a flow battery is suitable for a stationary energy storage application as it's easily scalable. Here the components of our battery are stacked together to form seven cells that are sandwiched between steel end plates. The stack is then secured using 10 bolts. So now we have the components, let's go and prepare the electrodes and start to assemble the battery. Firstly, the graphite electrodes have to be cut to the correct size and shape. They are then sanded to remove the polymer layer and to improve adhesion. And finally, they are cleaned with acetone to remove any grease. Here you can see the difference that the preparation makes to the electrodes. Foam insulation material is then fitted between the current collectors and the end plates at either side of the battery. This is then glued on the copper current collector and holds the wire in contact with the plates. Before assembling each cell, the acrylic plates and the steel end plates have to be cleaned to remove dust and grease. A thin layer of silicon sealant is applied to each acrylic plate, sealing the cells and preventing any electrolyte leaks. When the sealant becomes tacky, the electrodes together with the meshes are sandwiched between two acrylic plates to form an individual cell. The sealant is then left to dry for 24 hours. So now, let's go and see if the silicon has sealed and test the battery for leaks. The sealing is carefully checked before proceeding with the battery assembly. It is important to make sure that the electrolyte, which contains lead, does not leak. The assembly starts with a steel backplate, onto which every layer is aligned using a series of bolts. The negative current collector is first mounted against the backplate, while the wire is run through the central hole. All of the seven cells are then stacked and sealed together. After fitting the positive current collector, together with the other end plate, it is now time to create a flow path by inserting a blanking plug and a spigot, through which a spiral wrap is run. The tubes are secured onto each spigot by using Jubilee clips. As the battery is now complete, we can check if there are any leaks. We do this by completely filling it with distilled water and letting the assembly sit for a couple of hours. The system doesn't leak, so let's prepare the electrolyte and test the battery. The electrolyte is made up of 0.7 molar methane sulfonic acid solution, 5 millimolar of hexadecal trimethyl ammonium hydroxide, a 0.7 molar solution of lead to methane sulfonate. The chemicals are diluted to give the required concentration of electrolyte and mixed well together. The three components are made separately in labelled volumetrics and then combined. The resulting electrolyte is then poured carefully into the reservoir 
and pumped round the system. The battery can now be cycled using a Baziatech battery analyzer. This is the result from the first test, where the current is displayed in orange and the voltage in blue. Unfortunately the battery failed to discharge properly as can be seen at the 7 minute mark. Therefore we decided to take the battery apart and check what went wrong. Firstly the electrolyte solution went brown, meaning that lead dioxide had not deposited onto the electrodes properly but it has precipitated into the electrolyte. When we then took the battery apart, we found that lead had deposited correctly on the negative electrode, but the positive electrode was almost completely clean. In addition, large amounts of lead dioxide were present throughout the battery, blocking the flow paths, as you can see. To solve these problems, we updated our battery design by adding reticulated vitreous carbon or RVC foam electrodes to improve the adhesion of the lead dioxide. Also a different sealant is used to increase the gap between consecutive electrodes and the flow path is modified to force the electrolyte through each cell in turn. This modified battery performed much better, completing three charge-discharge cycles without failing. To check the deposits on the electrodes, we took the battery apart again. This time some lead dioxide is present, but the RVC contact with the graphite electrode was poor. Some lead dendrites were also observed increasing the chance of shorting the battery. In the final static test, the pump was switched off and the performance of the battery measured. Here the results show that the system only completed two cycles before failing. On dismantling the battery again, the deposits on the electrodes were all at the bottom of the battery due to the high density of lead in the stationary electrolyte. Our redesigned battery worked better than the initial prototype, and it is the largest reported soluble lead acid flow battery to date, demonstrating the scalability of the chemistry. Lead acid is the most popular battery chemistry today. As these batteries reach the end of their lives, they can be recycled to sustainably produce soluble lead acid flow batteries. Such research projects will allow for a greater share of renewable generation to be implemented into our future energy mix, significantly reducing the carbon emissions.